And um, there were no, those from the Patrick Houghton era and from, from the John Birdby era. And, I, and they, they just painted such vivid pictures in, in my mind and felt like I was actually there. Um, you know, those, those like the Spider Man and the <coughs> Snow Man. Uh, I really. Uh, I read those so many times, and then only came to actually watch the programs many years later. Um, and you know, so many things are different, as, as we know. And I pictured this uh, in the Curse of Peldon, for example, the wonderful um, combat between the Doctor and Grun, where it's depicted as being this enormous amphitheater, and uh, and you see it on television, and it's not disappointing as such, but slightly different, isn't it? Uh, not quite how how one might have imagined it to be. Um, I'm reading The Cave Monsters with my daughter at the moment, and uh, uh, it, it's brilliant how it's just been reinvented as a novel. It's not just a novelization of the seven episodes. Um, we're really getting into the whole first half where it's, uh, it's Dr. Queen's story, isn't it? And it's Miss Dawson's story, and they really come alive as, as, as characters. And you've got a kind of mini cliffhanger built in halfway, uh, one of the scene where, where Monica burns his way out of Dr. Queen's cut under the stairs. And uh, I love that bit, and that little bit of the story comes to an end. And, and it's, it, Malcolm Holt is so good at, at bringing out the characters and making you feel that you're actually reading a novel in its own right and not just a novelization. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are all kinds of different ways of, of interpreting uh, the, the, the TV script for, for, for a novel, but um, I think that having, having something which can exist in its own right is, is part of it for me. I mean, I, I agree as much as. Um Back in the day before, back in the day before DVDs, um, and even if you're watching Doctor Who as a kid in the 70s, um, you can take it anywhere with you. It's, it's a finite thing. But novels gave us all um, this ability to re-experience uh, what we've seen on the television, and in many cases, what we've never seen, seen could only imagine. Um, as, I, as a kid growing up, that was just so exciting.
commentary, there was some really powerful characterization of the doctor in that, that nobody had even dared do in the books before. So there are, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, there's that line of thinking that the actual new series used some of those later uh, new adventure titles to kick it off for you. We've got a panel about that next. You have, yeah, <laughs> so, so I'll not mention any of that. Um, so the, the, the actual, the, the original novels, the original Target novels, how, how much leeway did those original writers have to, to, to branch out and flesh out with their actual work? Was, were, were, they, were they mostly just adaptations of the actual stories? Was it, was it, was it Malcolm Hunt who originally took the idea and fleshed it out to, to a vast degree? Or? Well, I think you're about to take a bit of it. Yeah. I mean, who literally was given the second story to, uh, second, you know, the second, you know, first story, second story, and turned it into a complete new introduction, avoiding, you know, avoiding uh, uh, Fischar altogether. And a lovely book, absolutely superb. I mean, how many of us? In one of the first books we were necessarily for me, one of the first books I remember reading, you know, he and all the common and going to find the TARDIS, and then suddenly in the alien city with the darkness. So, and right at the beginning, tons of leeway, I think. I would say so, yes. I mean, like, what, what I love about the target range is that there, there doesn't seem to have been any particular house style imposed on the writers. The writers have had the freedom to interpret the scripts however they, they chose, really. And, as Martin said earlier, there, there is great skill in doing the, the Terence Dix style adaptation of you know, what seems a very straightforward and an easy read, but um, I think all writers know that how, how something that seems so easy can be so hard to produce, and to have that wonderful economy of style and that punchiness that reproduces what you've seen on screen in, in, a, in a, a prose uh, manner can be very hard to do, and, and Terence has an enormous skill at, at doing that. Um, and then you've got the, the, the books which, I suppose like the, the, um, the Ian Martyr type books, which um, take the television script and, and add uh, extraneous detail and things which weren't there on screen but which, which in, enrich the script. Um, I remember reading the novelisation of The Dominators, for example, before I saw that on screen and enjoyed that enormously and look forward to seeing that on, uh, on video. And finally well, saw a, a grainy fifth generation copy and was slightly disappointed. Um, but uh, I, I loved um, I loved the Martyr's descriptive touches. Um, I remember the, the Sontaran experiment where he described the, the Sontaran having this oily breath, these fumes coming out of the Sontaran's mouth. And even at that age, I remember thinking, well, oh, Ian Martyr, Martyr played Harry Sullivan, so he was there on location, so he must have known that the Sontaran had <laughs> oily breath. So that's really very clever. Um, and then you've got this whole other group, of course, which reinvent the, the books, uh, reinvent the, the, the scripts uh, as books, as we were saying. And something like the Myth Maker, the John Cotton book, which just, uh, just has, has great fun rewriting the thing from a, from a first person perspective. It's an enormously uh, entertaining book in, in its own right. Um, so, yeah, I think having, having leeway and having freedom to interpret the script in your own way is, is, is very important. And uh, I think. Uh, it, I think it's come through that there's been so many voices and so many styles in, in that range. Yeah. So, just, just while I've got you dangling with the mic, yeah. would, would you say there was there was any particular, was it a Doctor Who novel that got you interested in writing, that got you into the new adventures? And the first got me interested in writing, I mean, you'd have to go back to when I was a child, really, because um, I was always aware of the fact that uh, you know, I wanted to write, and um, uh, you know, I, I used to take Doctor Who books out of the library every week. Um, that whole first batch that I, that I remember taking on holiday with me, the Cybermen, Bond, the Snowmen, Doomsday Weapon. Um, so th there are those, and then there are those as a, as a young person that, that, that I read, which made me realise again what, what the potential of, of the series was, and when the, the, the target books were starting to, to become a, you know, a bit more adventurous, like those at the end of the range, like the Curse of Fenwick, for example, um, which were almost kind of new adventures prototypes, really. Yeah. Um, and, they, again, it made me realise again on another level what, what the series could, could, could do. Yeah. How, how did you actually get into the writing of the New Adventures novels? How I got into the writing of the New Adventures novels was that um, I, I think, like a lot of people, I, I was aware that Peter Darwell Evans um, was asking for, uh, for, for submissions of um, synopses and sample chapters. And uh, you know, back in the middle of the last recession, this was, uh, there was a publisher actually asking people to send in uh, submissions, and so um, yeah, I sent it off, and uh, 
waited, waited for a few months and got a very nice letter back saying we would, we would like to, to do this at some point. Um, and gradually it was built into this, this arc of, uh, of five books and I didn't worry too much about the continuity of that because I knew that Paul would be uh, mopping it all up in the end in his book. So <laughs> we left all of that to him. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was very exciting. Uh, so speak, speak of speaking of continuity of the book, clearly you've read the dissertation on that, have you not? Uh, yes. Um, so there's a paper talking about the Atari novels and how they led into the new adventures. But I think one of the one of the important things about the Atari books is that once Virgin started to catch up on the late stories, what you got was they could get the writer of the original story to come in and do the, the novelization of the book, which meant that they owned the story. They knew exactly what was, and they knew all the stuff they wanted to do in it, but they hadn't been able to do it on TV. So they could come in and put all the things back, like glass garlics and battles in warehouses. And I, I think it really it helped them write them as better books because they went, now I can do what I want to do with the story make it into something new for the for the new uh, Mark, you contributed to the, the discontinuity guide, mm. which made it new happening. I'm guessing that you I don't want to pick up on the continuity too much because that's gonna be something to pick up on later on. So it's hard because it was a box up. Um, you, you wrote for the new adventures, but you also wrote for the BBC series, did you not? Yeah, well, I didn't actually write for the new adventures. I, I tried, um, and it didn't work. Um, so the, the one version novel I did, well, actually was going to be a new adventure, and then they, they, they launched the BBC adventures. So. But yes, the majority of my work was for the BBC. Um, as Daniel says, as far back as, you know, reading the first uh, new adventure, knowing there was an open door was, was absolutely amazing. Um, and literally there must have been hundreds of us, young writers, trying, trying to, you know, see this wonderful opportunity, loving Doctor Who, loving writing, you know, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? So he said stuff in. And for me, um, I very nearly had what would have been an early version of Sleep of Reason, which is what I later did for the BBC. Uh, very near, I mean, I wrote the whole thing for, for Peter, because he, I wrote a chunk and he liked it, and I just carried on writing it. I was living in Gibraltar at the time, so I thought it was the whole thing. My wife was working hard. Um, so I literally wrote the whole novel. And then he fractionally said that. Uh, it was the most um, But there was obviously enough in it to, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was obviously enough in it that he did like, and so it just took, took me a very long time, much, much longer than, than, than Paul, who's of course a genius and that helps, uh, much longer than that. So I did one, and then the BBC switch came about, we were talking about it quite last night, I'm not quite sure why. Um, Keith and I had an idea with Virgin, the whole, obviously the whole, all the manuscripts <coughs> must have got shifted to the BBC wholesale. <coughs> Maybe they were reordered. I was happy to come up at the top, and so um, I took it from there. And for me, it wasn't so much a new opportunity because I knew, even though I'd written in Menagerie my Virgin book, a book that uh, didn't go down very well, I wasn't very happy with. It's very good, you know. Peter and and Bex, to their next credit, didn't you know? They said that's it. You blow it. It was awful. What on earth do you think you were doing? Um, it just didn't happen. Whereas when I switched to the BBC, um, Keith and I had a couple accepted fairly quickly, and for us there was no real difference. Um, it just so happened something different to the publishing, and you were dealing with, with different people. Um, right, uh, that's open up to the floor. We've got any questions <coughs> for our panel? What's, what's it like writing for the current range of um, DC books? You've done that, haven't you, Martin? It's, it's brilliant because, um, as I was saying at the beginning, perhaps more backs than by design, you have a sense uh, that when you were growing up, there were different books aimed at different ages. Um, 
And it's, it's a little like that with the BBC now. I mean, what, you, what you're trying to do is obviously still appeal to the fans. There's no point you know, doing anything that's completely... By fans, I mean us older people. Um, but you've got this wonderful uh, market of young people who can go and make everything very family friendly, which is perfectly fine. And so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a completely different challenge. It's much uh, easier in many ways right at the end of instead of sort of the first half of the BBC um, uh, range when I was doing sleep review. Much easier to write an adult novel, much easier to be told you can do pretty much what you want, go for it. Much more interesting and harder, but in, in a sense, differently satisfying to, to have some sort of uh, constraint and not see those constraints as, as a negative thing, but actually I'm appealing to a very different audience. Um, I still want to try to not bore the adults, but it's got to be zippy, it's got to be um, engaging, it's got to be all the things that perhaps uh, you can lose sight of if you're writing a very character-driven, very psychological book for adults. Um, so there is a difference, but it's, it's still it's still Doctor Who, it's still exciting, and it's still um, a can, can we ask that same question of yourself, Daniel, about the you've got autonomy which you've recently published it? Yes. Um, as Martin says, it's still Doctor Who, it's still the same uh, process in, in a way. Um, what I found exciting was being able to write something which is part of, of something ongoing and something which is uh, you know, so so big and to be able to have the Doctor's characterization unfolding in front of you and to be able to try try your best to reproduce that um, through, through the dialogue that you write and make that character come to life on, on the page. Um, and the, with the new adventures, I mean, I only did two, but um, the, 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 somebody described them once as struggling with this idea of dancing on three dots, which I think is perhaps a little unfair, but I, I get the idea that you know, we, we, we were kind of aware all the time of the fact that we couldn't really push it on anywhere because there was always this idea that we were, we were following on from the BBC series, but we weren't really able to, to, to develop it uh, in the way that the series did. And we did everything we pretty much could, I think. Um, but the, we, we're writing standalone books which are aimed at a family audience and which are part of uh, an ongoing TV series. It's, it's, a, it's a different challenge, but it's, it's still Doctor Who. Um, and it was great to be able to, uh, to, to be part of that and, and not to feel really that there was anything that I had to change. Um, there, was a, there was one joke actually, there was one joke, I don't know if Justin Richards uh, will allow me to mention this, but uh, one joke that I was asked to take out, um, which was um, where, at one point where the doctor makes a pun about an Orton being called Joe. He says, oh, Joe Orton, and he puts the sonic screwdriver to his ears and says, prick up your ears, Joe. Which, I can absolutely understand why that was, uh, was taken out, because it wasn't appropriate. And uh, I thought I'd get away with that, and I didn't. So, um, but yeah, that's the only thing. Um, so, and, and everything else, uh, I, 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 you know, I felt um, I, I got away with it. So, yes, it was great fun. Yeah, I think what you what you find writing for the new series is very much that there aren't a lot of restrictions on you that people think that there will be. The, there was nothing changed about the many hands, there was nothing put in or taken out because they said you can't do that, and I do. And I had zombies running around Edinburgh and bits falling off, so you know, it's, you're allowed to do pretty much what you, you were allowed to do with the books before. But I think the only the only thing that you do find is that there is a very strong temptation to try and do it exactly as the TV show does it. But I think the opening of the many hands could have been better because it was very much, I had in my, in my head that it was David Tennant and Martha running around and it would all be zipping excited for things that would have people reading this, it's not car chasing. <laughs> so I think that, that's something that you need to look out for, you need to try and not slavishly do what TV does because in, at the end of the day it is a book but it's very easy to run it for new Doctor Who because the, the characters are just so vivid, they're there in your head and they just sort of fall on the page really. So because, because you, you, you have got that much more freedom, does that mean you then have the equivalent of a tone reading in your head because it's the new series and you're writing for it and obviously you don't need a tone reading but do you, do you go through that kind of same process in the head before you put the right ears to say how does this fit within the context of the I, I think certainly with my book there was 
there was a feeling that it was playing into a very specific gap in, in the new series. It was set during one of the episodes, and so you knew what was coming after it and before it, which a lot of people don't when they're writing their books because they're writing for the next after. So the, there was a very much a feeling that they had to try and fit into that particular season and that feel of how it was. But it, it still had to be, you know, of course I was, I was writing, so I wasn't, I wasn't trying to slavishly copy what was being done in it, but to a certain extent, it, a fan has to be able to pick it up and read it and, and feel that they are reading a book based on the series that they like. Yeah. Got any more questions from the floor? Yes, one from Charlie. Um, like yourself, I can made a connection with when I was a kid reading Doctor Who and the Zarbi and then realising when I saw the Wet Planet that they were different in many more ways than just the title. Um, is there, assuming we're in a parallel universe where the books never existed, is there a classic story any, uh, uh, all of you would like to get your hands on and novelise? Is there a classic story? You'd like to. You'd like to write yourselves, like write. given another shot at it. The only reason I'm repeating it is because we've got a webcam there, and we need the volume levels up. Okay. Now, now having a shout, so the people on the web can actually hear what the questions are. <laughs> That's okay, John. It's not people. You need this. Sorry, honest, it's not. Uh, so yeah, Charlie's question. So, a classic story that we would like to have a go at novelising. What would you like um, to do one, yourself? One that's already been novelised, but we'd like to have a go at it ourselves. Yes. Oh, or maybe gosh. one you thought wasn't done particularly well. <laughs> <laughs> That's really unfair, unfair to our colleagues, but um, um, yeah, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, um, you know, I'm thinking about those that haven't been done, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a great fan of Sharda, and that's never going to get, never going to get, uh, you know, produced as a book, because that was the first Adam's uh, estate won't uh, let it be done. Um, but uh, I, I love the humour in Shara, I love the, I love the way it had that, uh, that heck, was it the perfect blend of hectic menace and humorous self-mockery? That was the old uh, quote from the back of the books, wasn't it? So, um, yes, it's, a, it's an unloved story, so I would love to have a crack at that. I, I think it would be what used to be called Dalek Cutaway, now I'm not sure what they call it anymore, but they, they sort of prequel to the Dalek Master Plan, just that one episode that doesn't have the Doctor in or anyone, and just Daleks killing things. I think that would be a good one to do something with. Yeah. It's, it's so short, wasn't it? So you can cut it out. Like. <laughs> uh, off the top of my head, I suppose I would go for Time to Win Chang purely because I could see myself uh, working in that atmosphere. I like that style. It's the sort of story that, you know, a very lived Halloween universe uh, might have written Obviously not as well. Um, so yeah, you, you'd be better in, in my case. I think I'd go for one of my favourites and uh, six episodes of the stuff and the ability to expand it and really get to grips with the characters and yeah, and spend turning it into a book would be would be lovely. The talent of Wen Chai Yang using the sixth doctor, that's what I'll that'd be brilliant in my head. Uh, any more questions for the floor? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. What's your question? Yeah. Um, like, what about from the, just to re repeat the new, uh, the same question from the new series, I mean, are there any episodes from the new series you think would work better with books and, uh, you know, we're going to have a good laugh? I think the new series would be better with books. Terms and which would work on, on the screen, so I feel like you know I'd, I'd had a go at writing a big two-part epic anyway, um, which has got a cliffhanger in the middle. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to have a go at, at doing any of, of, of the TV episodes. I think that they work brilliantly as TV episodes, but I would love to, to see them novelised. I don't know whether I, I would be the person to do it, but uh, it would it would be great if um, there could be the equivalent of target novelisations of, of the new series for people to have on their shelves in any retentive manner, all <laughs> with, with lovely coloured spines and so on, and, and, uh, and the, the logo at the top. Wouldn't that be great? The right logo, of course. Yes. Uh, I'll take another one has seen the new movie. Yes, yeah, so Charlie's question. Yes, yeah, so what's your question? Yeah, 
what, what I love about the new logo is if you pay attention, right? I've got a bit of a design background. The serifs on the text, right? The